be to the Lord, aren't you this morning? We want to be in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 13, and uh, beginning in verse 10. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. If you're there, say amen this morning. Luke 13, beginning in verse 10, says this, And he, he of course being Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. There was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done. So come during them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Gospel of Luke. I tell you, this particular week was a little bit different for me. Usually my wife will tell you, Thursday is a day that just kind of the way he scheduled the week works out. Thursday is kind of a day I, when I get home from, from teaching, I kind of catch my breath a little bit and don't plan too much for a Thursday evening. And uh, this particular week, however, on Thursday, my boy will tell you too, uh, but uh, this particular week on a Thursday, the school district has this uh, thing they call learning and leading. And basically, they pick one person at each school from each grade level in math, my particular area, and they send you to a school in town and everybody meets there from all over the county and you have a wonderful two hour time together. (laughs) You can tell I'm trying to talk myself into believing it was wonderful. (laughs) I haven't talked myself into it yet. It's been a few days ago. Well, this particular week, I tell you, on Thursday, I I told my wife I didn't realize it, but. And Wednesday nights, after we got home, I'm like, my love, tomorrow is the Thursday, the once a quarter Thursday meeting that this is. And so on this particular Thursday, instead of coming home about 3.30 or 4 o'clock and having an easy evening, I had to, I didn't even get to come home in between. And I went to the middle school down by, uh, uh, down kind of South Fort Myers Way, and I went there, and I was there from 5 to 7 for a wonderful meeting. <laughs> and I didn't get home until about 7.30 or 8 o'clock that night. And, uh, and it, was, it was quite a long day. I come dragging in. I'm like, oh, what up? I don't know. So, so Thursday wasn't quite the day. Now, I will tell you, I, I mentioned to my family, this Thursday, uh, September the 28th, was the one-year anniversary of Ian. I'm like, they scheduled it. Oh, not that that really makes a difference, but... But you know when our next one is, is scheduled for quarter two is December 7th. Now, some of you have that, but December 7th is uh, Pearl Harbor Day, the day that we're living. I said, but who made up these dates anyway? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but they had us go there, and I was there for two hours. Thursday was a little bit different day. It wasn't quite the, the, as happy or as easy of a day as what mine normally would be. So Friday was the day I was, I was looking forward to. We have different days that we look forward to. If you notice on the front of your bulletin today is the title of the old song. It says, Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. We look forward to different days, but how many know there's no day so great as a day when one comes to know Christ in a a person's life, at least here on this earth. Aren't you thankful there is, uh, for the Christian, we'll be with him finally, fully, and forever. One happy day, amen. But here it is, is that we're going to talk this morning about 
a happy day, about a day when something happened in the course, and it just happened to be of a church meeting, so to speak. It was at a synagogue where Jesus came, and the church back then, so to speak, on the Sabbath. It wouldn't have been on a Sunday, but basically a Saturday. And Jesus comes in, and we don't know for sure what he was teaching. The verse that we began with just says he was teaching on the, on the Sabbath. I mean, you would hope that if Jesus was there, that there'd be a ton of folks there to hear the truth of the Word of God. And indeed, at times throughout Jesus' life, especially because he would do so many miracles, people would come from far and wide. But here he's in a setting where it's in a synagogue setting, and he is teaching. I don't know what he was teaching on that particular day. For whatever reason, God didn't see uh, that we needed to have that recorded in Scripture for us uh, for this particular passage. But how many know whatever he was teaching, it was good truth, right? Yeah. Jesus is there and he's teaching. And while he is teaching, in comes this woman. She is bent over. She has some kind of a, of a pain. I remember uh, Noah had his appendix out this past week and it brought my mind back to when I had my appendix out when I was in first grade. That's been a long time ago. I'm thankful they've come a long way since then. And I remember it was on a Sunday night. Now, we lived in Kentucky at the time. That's where I got this northern accent from. Right, we lived in Kentucky at the time. And I remember going out to get a little bucket of coal to bring in to the house. And I went out there. And I remember being out there with a friend of mine that lived next door. And I started hurting. Oh, it hurts so bad. Anyone here ever had your appendix taken out? And only a couple, three. What's that? Ruptured. <laughs> Mine was close to that when it was that that night. Mom and Dad asked me. They said, "They said, son, do you want to go to church or do you want to go to the hospital?" When I said, "I think I need to go to the hospital," they knew something was bad wrong. All right. And I, I we went to the hospital and they checked it out and they removed the thing and I woke up in the middle of the surgery. I did. I say middle. I don't know when it was. It might have been at the beginning. It might have been at the end. But whatever they gave me to knock me out, it didn't knock me out the whole time. I woke up, I still remember this day, seeing those doctors with the mask and all the garb on, and crying out what any first grader would call it, Mother! <laughs> she heard me outside. She almost came into the operating room. All right. But they put me out like a light right away. They put that mask back on me, and I went right back out, and then I don't remember nothing. Uh, but, uh, but at any rate, I remember such a pain. That had me bent over, and I was so concerned about that. I knew as a first grader something was terribly wrong. Well, in comes this woman. She is bent over. Now, the malady that she has, Scripture says specifically, was caused in some sense by Satan. Now, that doesn't mean that every uh, malady in this fallen world that you can say it was a spiritual reason here. But I will say this woman, she has she's been afflicted by Satan in some respect that has caused her to be bent over. And how long has she been bent over for? For 18 years. I was talking with uh, Danny this morning and, and his oldest daughter is 13, right? It's 13, it seems like yesterday, doesn't it? Yeah. And then he saw Benji, right? Benji's yeah. almost 16, not quite. He's 15 and taller than me. It's hard to believe, isn't it, Danny? But you think about that, this lady had been bent over with this malady for longer than our son has been alive. My wife and I, we've been married 16, it'll soon be 17 years, longer than what we've been married. You think about where you were at 18 years ago. Everybody in here was 11, because you're only 29, right? But you think about 18 years, that's a long time. She comes in with this malady, she has been with it. For 18 years. You know, sometimes in Scripture, not all the time, but there are times in Scripture, in the Gospel, in the book of Acts, other places as well, where people who received a miracle from God, it said how long they had this particular issue. You go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, and there's the woman with the issue of blood. Anybody remember that? Right? Jesus is in the middle of ministry, and someone comes to Jairus' house and says, hey, his daughter's about to die. Will you come? And Jairus says, will you come? And Jesus says, yes, I'll come. To, I'll come. And he, Jesus is on the way to Jairus' house. And midstream, this woman with this issue of blood, she'd had it for 12 years. 
And this woman comes and she touches the hem of his garment. And immediately this issue, which none of the, not no bad speaking about doctors here. I'm thankful for, for doctors. But this particular situation, the doctors couldn't do her no good. She only got worse for 12 years. She would spent all that she had. But on this one day, this one happy, glorious day, she touches the hem of his garment and is immediately made whole. After 12 years. You go to John chapter 5, the man at the pool of Bethesda. How many remember that? The lame man at the pool of Bethesda. He's waiting there for the moving of the waters. Jesus comes and says, do you want to be made whole? He says, well, Lord, if the water's moving. Everybody gets there before me. I can't. Yeah, Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. You know how long that man had been with his malady? 38 years. How many know that's a long time? You go into Acts. In the book of Acts, chapter 3, Peter and John, they're on their way at the time of prayer at the gate beautiful. Jesus has been crucified and gloriously risen and ascended to the hand of the Father and commissioned his apostles and, and to go and to spread this message of the gospel. And what happens, Peter and John, they're on their way there at the gate beautiful, there at the temple, and there's this man that's begging for alms. And Peter, he says, silver and gold have I not. But such as I have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the man who has been lame from his mother's womb. And scripture in Acts chapter 4 will tell us he was more than 40 years old. It doesn't say exactly how much more than 40. How many can say more than 40? <laughs> and we'll say how many. Now, more than 40 years this man had this affliction. But in a moment, he's made well. He's made whole. Oh, happy day indeed. Here is this woman. She is bent over. She comes there to the church service that day. She comes there to the synagogue. One of my favorite commentators, Warren Wearsby, when he was commenting on this passage, he said this. He said that he had never, not that he had never been sick, but he had never had a malady, a sickness, or some kind of terrible thing. He lived, too, to be like 90-something and he wrote books all the way up until the time that he went on to be with the Lord. And uh, he said that he, he basically was blessed with pretty good health most of his life and did so many things. And pastor and Bible teacher on the radio. But he said, he said, I don't know if I'd had this bent over thing for 18 years. He said, I don't know. I'd like to think that I would have gotten up enough strength, enough energy to want to come and be in church and be in the house of God. But after 18 years, I don't no, if I would have made it there or not. He says, I like to think that I would have, but if I'm honest, I don't know. You know, being bent over, not being able even to stand up. I think about my papa, my grandpa, I called him papa. And he was a man that had been a drunkard for many years. I never knew that man because he was saved about a year before I was born. The only man I ever knew was a man that loved Jesus and preached the word of God. And I'm thankful for that. But he had been very much in the world and very much a drunkard. I remember one time going through the house and he showed me a picture. He served in World War II. And he says, see that picture of that young man there? And it was him. He said, yeah. He said, I was intoxicated at that time. He said, but God has delivered me. And I tell you, I remember that. He hardly ever spoke about things like that either as far as his past. But that one day he did. But I remember being up there. They actually, they had called the family in and said that he was dying of lung cancer. He worked in the coal mines and of course before he was saved he had been on various substances that had uh, wounded his body but here it is that he uh, he was uh, been in the coal mines for a number of years. They said he's got lung cancer. And the Lord the, the, he, my papa would always say God can move in a way that none can hinder. That's why we would say. And he, we prayed for him and I remember praying for him down here and the Lord thankfully the Lord healed him of that and he went on to preach for Years after that, I'm thankful for that. And they were calling us in, saying he wasn't going to make it. But I remember going up there during time that he was receiving treatments and his body would get... So I never knew him to be anything but a very strong man. If he was hurt or if he... He wouldn't say nothing about it to you, all right? If somehow he was, you know, uh, not feeling well in some way, you never, you never knew it. But he was so weak in his body and I talked to him on the phone and he was in because of the treatments and so weakened his physical body. But I went up there to see him during that time. And it came Sunday morning. And he couldn't hardly stand the air conditioning because it made him very, uh, 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 
you know, his body was very sensitive to this at this time, sensitive to all things. But he wanted to go to church, and I went there, and I took him to church. And the way that church was set up, they had Sunday school rooms, one at the right and one at the back, that they could kind of close off. It was an old building. They could close it off with doors from the main sanctuary, but, it, but yet you were close enough to the main sanctuary you could hear. And he went in there, and he sat in one of those side rooms, and he cracked open the door. He couldn't stand the air conditioning in the sanctuary, but he sat in the side room and cracked the door open so that he could sing the songs of praise with the people of God and hear the word of God preached. And I tell you, truth be told, he probably won't be hearing anything he hadn't heard before, him being a preacher himself. But I will tell you this, though. He went there because he knew he wanted to be in the house of God with the people of God, praising God, hearing the word of God. And I think about this woman, 18 years and she comes, but that was her day of healing. It was a healing day for her. And I would tell you, I've seen the Lord do a lot over the course of time. How many here have ever been healed in your body in some way or other, right? How many know of good happening to others? And God touching them in their life. Now, truth be told, anyone that's honest will tell you, you know, there's some of these preachers that get on here and tell you that, uh, you know, uh, uh, nothing bad ain't never going to happen to you and all the rest of this. And they make promises that God didn't make. And Lord knows they can't keep in and of themselves. But I will tell you this. There's sometimes when things don't happen with regard to healing or other things that we have prayed for to happen. But I will tell you this. If you are a child of God, it could be that he could heal you today of whatever it would be, illness-wise, emotional-wise, any kind of... How many know nothing's beyond the scope of his power? Today could be the day, but I would tell you, if you are in Christ, maybe it is that it's been 18 years. Maybe it's been 38 years. Maybe it's been 40 or more years. Maybe it won't even come this side of glory. But there is coming a day when this flesh that was sown in corruption will be raised incorruptible. That was sown being perishable will be raised imperishable. That was sown in dishonor will be raised in honor. If indeed you are in Christ, you'll be raised up with a glorified body. How many are thankful for that? And not only with a glorified body where there's no more aches or pains or this or that. How I many wake up every night again and things are new every morning? <laughs> right? Sometimes it seems that way. But I would tell you, not only a glorified body with no more of those issues with which to deal, but even more importantly, in a glorified body where you won't wrestle with the sin that would so easily beset us with the struggles and temptation of this world, finally, fully, and forever giving praise to God who saved you, who redeemed you. How many are thankful there is a healing day for the child of God? Lazarus, he didn't have to wait 18, he waited in four days. Right? But he was raised from the dead. Now he died again. But how many are thankful if he is in Christ? What Jesus said in John 11 to his sisters is very true. Those who believe in him, though they were dead, yet shall they live. For he is the resurrection and the life. How many are thankful? There is a healing day for the child of God. Amen. Look here next. It's not only was it a healing day that happened that. That was a positive thing. The next thing I like things that start with the same letter sometimes. This next one is a day of hubris. Now, if you know what hubris, hubris means pride. How many know there's a lot of proud days for humanity, isn't there? You say, where does that come in? Well, Jesus, he heals this woman. Right there. Now, and she starts glorifying God. I mean, it says right there, she began glorifying God. You say, what does that mean? I don't know if she did a little dance. I don't know if she had a shout. I don't know if she got teary-eyed and all the mess like that. I don't know exactly what she did, but I know if you looked at her and you heard her, you know she's glorifying God, Amen. right? And so here it is. She's glorifying God. And this religious official, this synagogue official, the one who was the ruler of the synagogue, kind of like Jairus, who was by name, this one, he was in charge of the building. He was in charge of setting up the meeting times. He was in charge of supervising the teaching there at the synagogue. And yet all these things, him being around the things of God, around the Word of God, how sad that when Jesus, the Word of God, stood before him, rather than receive his teaching and receive his work, what does this synagogue official do? He jumps up and it, can you imagine the pride it takes to stand up and correct Jesus? 
Is that, that's the ultimate hubris, the ultimate pride, isn't it? I tell you, it's one thing, my students, right, sometimes they'll get mad at one another and they'll say some things to one another they shouldn't. That's one thing, to do something like that and correct a fellow student, one of their peers, in ways that perhaps they shouldn't. It's another thing when they do it to Mr. Schmunk and all of God's people say, Amen. I love you people. <laughs> But I tell you, it's even more when the principal comes in, and I've had this happen before. The principal can come in, and they don't show him any respect either. I would imagine if the superintendent came in, or the governor came in, or the president came in, it might not make any difference at all for some of them. Why? Because each time there is just your 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 not being respectful of the person or the position that's in front of you. But can I tell you, the ultimate pride, the ultimate hubris, the ultimate example of I am the one in charge of everything and I want to tell you what to do is to say something like that to God. Can you imagine? And this synagogue of fish, he stands up and he doesn't talk to Jesus directly, but he talks to the people that are there, Scripture takes note of that. He doesn't talk to Jesus directly, although Jesus will talk to him in a minute. But he talks to the people there, and he, what does he say to them? He says, there are six days to come for healing. Six days that you can come for such things. And you're coming on the Sabbath day to get healed? Now, I will tell you, I've mentioned it before, but as a pastor, when you see people that you love and care for go through things, and when God, and maybe they go through it for days, or weeks, or months, or years, and you pray about these situations and circumstances, and then you see a breakthrough, I tell you, this one gentleman I mentioned yesterday, uh, it's been a long time since he was ever inside the doors of the church, although he has been inside the doors of the church before. But when I saw, and I could think that he was... He was having a, that, that he was, that God was giving a breakthrough to where the gospel was getting through to his heart and mind. Because I could hear a little bit of the conversation. I turned to my wife there. She's doing the pork and potatoes and I'm doing the green beans and corn. I said, my love, we need to pray. I think this individual, I think God's drawing him unto salvation. We need to pray. Because my heart just rejoiced. Even more so, I will tell you, of people that I know and know very closely. And I see God do something in their life. I tell you, they, I'm going to glorify God too and get it right. But here is a man that's supposed to be in charge. And what happens? He sees this woman that's been coming for 18 years and been over. And now she's made well. And he is upset with Jesus. Can you imagine? Why was he upset? Jesus did, and some of you, we've talked about it in here before. Many of you will be well familiar that the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, which was the group in charge of the synagogues especially, they had a whole list of things that weren't supposed to be happening on the Sabbath day. Now, they made up their list. They had a revelation in addition to the Word of God. Brother Kevin was telling me here a week or so ago, some fellow claims that he has John 22. John doesn't have 22 chapters. He ain't never going to have 22 chapters. They can say that it does. They are breaking the very admonition that God gave in the book of Revelation that you shall not add to this. And you know who he added? Who he had? Write that down. John. <laughs> kind of ironic, right? But here it is. is that, that they added to God's word, the Pharisees did. And they said that there's all these things that can't be done on the Sabbath day because you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath day. And here it is. If you go through, do a search with your Strong's Concordance. If you still have, how many have those? I tell you, I said there's called Strong's. So you've got to be strong to carry them around. <laughs> but you go to the Strong's Concordance. You go and do the Google machine. However you search through Scripture. Search for a verse that says, A woman cannot be healed of an 18-year-old disease on the Sabbath. You won't find it. Because <laughs> it's not in God's Word. Jesus never broke God's Word. He's the Word of God made flesh, the second person of God. Had. He never broke God's Word, but he didn't care too much about man's traditions. And not only did he not care about but he, he criticized, ridiculed those who put their tradition above the Word of God. He came to them, and, and he healed this woman, and this man that's so upset, this man filled with pride, filled with hubris. Why is he correcting Jesus? Not because Jesus violated the Word of God, but because he violated their man-made tradition, and 
The man thought man was in charge. How many know man's not in charge? God's in charge. Amen. And here it is, is that what transpires, Jesus, if you search the scriptures, he, he healed, there were seven different miracles recorded that he did on the Sabbath day. Because he just kept coming back at him, back at him, back at him. He would do it on the Sabbath day. And they'd get upset with him. Matthew chapter 12. And I'll just give you the reference here. But Matthew chapter 12, it's a Sabbath day. Jesus and his disciples are going through a field. His disciples are hungry. And they glean some of the grain to eat. And what happened is, is that the religious leaders come and say, how is this so? They're doing work on the Sabbath day. Now, if you study the Old Testament, you could glean from the fields when you were hungry, and it wasn't considered thievery either. You weren't like taking the best. Part. You were gleaning from the fields for someone who was hungry. And all that the Old Testament forbade on the Sabbath with regard to this particular area was to do a massive amount of work toward profit in that case. You weren't supposed to be doing that, but to meet your own, to go through and eat uh, uh, and to meet your need on the Sabbath day of food, that wasn't breaking any kind of law. They come to Jesus and they say, hey, hey your disciples, they're breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus, he quotes to them from the Old Testament when David's man ate of the showbread. And then he goes on to say, on the Sabbath day, he says the priest in the temple, they don't get a break. They work on the Sabbath day. And then Jesus says something. He says, something greater than the temple is here. Who was he talking about? Himself. That's a claim to him being God right there. Amen. He says, ah, something greater than the temple is here. And then he says this statement. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 8, he says this. He says that the Son of Man himself is Lord of the Sabbath. Who was the one who gave the Sabbath command in the Old Testament? Though they had misinterpreted it, to be sure. Who was the one? God himself. When Jesus says he's Lord of the Sabbath, he just said he was greater than the temple. Now he says he's Lord of the Sabbath. How many know? He is the high and holy one. He is God in the flesh. And this man, to poke in his, his thumb in the eye of God himself, is the ultimate example of pride, of hubris. How many know hubris, pride doesn't go very well, does it? James 4, 6, God is opposed to the proud. If God is for you, that's in the southern accent. If God is for you, who can be again you? But if God is again you, who can be for you? <laughs> right? and, and he says, God says he's opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. How many know those with hubris, those with pride, is something going to go well with them. God's opposed to them. You want an example? Go back to Satan. Satan himself thought he would take over heaven. I will exalt myself above God. That didn't go very well for him. He got kicked out by the one who's in control. You look at uh, Genesis chapter 11. Mankind, they gather together to build this tower of Babel up to the sky, breaking God's command, thinking they'll make a name for themselves. God puts up with it only for so long, and then he shatters the tower and spreads them across the face of the earth. I don't know, pride doesn't go, go very well, does it? You look at some of the kings, we studied some of the kings here recently, and may more in the weeks to come on Wednesday nights, but you look at some of the kings, even some of the good ones. There was an Old Testament king named Asa, and he was one of the good kings. He cried out to God in a humble prayer. How many of humility goes a long way? He cries out to God in a humble way when there's a million-man army coming from Ethiopia against him. He cries out to God, and God gives him a victory over a million-man army. We don't have too many armies in our present day that's a million men, right? And some, but not many. And what happens here is this, God gives him a victory. Well, then he's facing another, he's facing Baasha, that's a, a lesser king that is Egypt from the north. And what does he do? But he basically sells out the things of God and he goes to a foreign power and a prophet Hanani comes and, and uh, uh, confronts him and he puts the prophet in prison. And Asa, this man used by God for a, a, to defeat a million man army, he gets a foot disease and dies from a foot disease. How many know? And again, this was considered one of the good kings, but he fell into this area of pride. Can I tell you, man's pride only goes so far if God will ultimately put his foot down, so to speak. Uzziah. How many have heard of that famous Isaiah passage where Isaiah is in the temple? But it begins with, in the year that King Uzziah died. How many have heard that before? Uzziah was a good king as well. 
but he became proud in his heart and he went to offer up some incense that only the priests were supposed to offer up. He was struck with leprosy and died from it. How I many pride doesn't end well? Pride does not end well. You go to the New Testament and you will see Herod in Acts chapter 12, not Herod the Great from the Gospels, but one of his descendants. Herod is there. He's given a speech at the end of Acts chapter 12 and the people trying to flatter him say, the voice of God and not of a man. And Herod was stricken dead by worms from God. For what reason? Because he wouldn't give glory to God. You go to Psalm 2. It says, why do the nations rage and gather together against the Lord and His anointed one? Why do they come in pride thinking that somehow they are the ones that make the rules. They're the ones who are in charge. They're going to rise up against God, just like the synagogue official, just like Satan, just like the Tower of Babel, just like these ones that thought they could uh, go against the boundaries that God had set, just like Herod, who wouldn't give glory to God, and just like every man that doesn't bow the knee in this life to Christ. They are coming against God and saying somehow, we make the rules and we're in charge. And Psalm 2 says, the God in heaven, what does he do? He laughs. He scoffs. And you know what's going to happen one day to all of these? You know what's going to happen? They're going to have those who rose up in pride. They're going to have a day of humiliation. And that's the next H word here. Healing, hubris, now humiliation. You say, where does humiliation come in? Jesus comes, this synagogue official who stood up and said, why are you doing this on the Sabbath day? Come some other day. Jesus doesn't take it lying down, so to speak. He doesn't hold back correcting this man. He comes to this man and he says to him this. He says, you're a hypocrite. He says, if you had, if you had uh, uh, one of your animals that was in need of water, you would go and loose him. And I will tell you, in the Greek, it's the same word as with this woman. She was loosed from her sickness. And here it is. Jesus says, you would loose that animal. He's a little play on words here in the Greek. Same, same thing. You loose the animal... And you would think that, say that's okay. But for this woman to be loose, and you're uptight, and you're, getting, you're, you're somehow saying I've done something wrong. He said, you would loose an animal, and yet you have more compassion on the animal than what you would have on this woman who's had this for 18 years. Jesus calls him out, humiliates the man. He won't let it stay that now I tell you, when he humiliates the man, and he does, and notice, if you go to, I'll, I'll read it directly so you see that. You can look here and reference it. But look at verse 17. As Jesus said this, his opponents were being humiliated. Humiliated. In other words, he, he humiliated this one and any of his other opponents were humiliated that day. Jesus calls him out and says, you have more compassion on an animal than you would have upon this woman. And he humiliates the man. Now you may say, I, I don't like for anybody to be humiliated. Anybody to, well, can I tell you, the man needed corrected, didn't he? Right. The truth needed to be taught and preached and proclaimed, didn't it? Yeah. And not only that, but even for this man. If this man isn't confronted by his sin, Jesus, by humiliating him, not that we don't have any record that the man repented of what he had done by correcting Jesus. We don't have any record he repented of his pride. We don't have any record of that. But how many know, if he wasn't corrected, he wasn't even, Jesus, by correcting him, is not only standing up for the truth. Jesus, by humiliating this man, isn't just standing up for the woman. It's standing up for himself as far as him having healed this woman on the Sabbath and standing up for his teaching. Jesus, by humiliating this man, is actually giving him, if he would Repent is giving him a lifeline to repent and put trust in the true and living God instead of go down this continued sinful path. How many know he confronted the man? He humiliated the man. And all that the man were humble enough to come and to, to, to repent and put trust in Christ. We've got a, a song. Maybe we'll do it on Wednesday. We'll see a, a, a new song. And it's called I Cry Holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb that was slain to wash all my guilty, staying away is the chorus. But the verses, the verses of this particular one, the man that wrote this song, he tells the story behind it. And he says he would be in a, 
church service and he would see folks that didn't know Christ that were proud that had rejected the gospel and he would see some of them to be broken and to be uh, to be humbled and to bow the knee to Christ and to put trust in him and he would see others who were weak and yet made strong by the word of God but he begins by saying this what makes a strong man suddenly weak humbled and shaken and brought to his knees is when his heart is broken by the love of a holy God. Amen. And can I tell you, by this proud man being humiliated by Jesus, yes, he needed to correct it. Yes, Jesus and his honor and what he had done was going to be upheld as well as what he had done for this woman. But don't lose track of it. Why could Jesus bring such correction? Was it because he hated people? No. He brings it. He is love. Even God is love. And when he corrects, he is correcting, and perhaps it is that they, hopefully they would not reject, but this man, we don't know what he did or didn't do. But the humiliation could have been a day of salvation for him. But Jesus humiliates this man. So we have here, and all of his opponents, so we have a day of healing, a day of hubris, a day of humiliation, and finally, the fourth point, a day of honor. You say, what kind of honor? Well, first is this, honor to the woman that was bent over. Because she had been healed. How many know when someone does something for you, that's kind of an honor, right? Yeah. Right? See, that, that's an honor. And Jesus had done something great for this woman. But not only honored that way, but honored too by Jesus saying, Oh, not this daughter of Abraham as she is. He makes sure it's as she is right now. Oh, not this daughter of Abraham to be loosed from this that has bound her for this period of time. Now, I will tell you, some people read that and say, daughter of Abraham? Well, of course she's a daughter of Abraham. She's Jewish. But if you look at Jesus and John the Baptist ministry and then the Apostle Paul subsequently, when they came to use about being a son or daughter of Abraham, John the Baptist would say, don't think because you're children of Abraham according to the flesh is what he's speaking of. That somehow that gets you the merit before God. God could raise up from these stones, children of Abraham. Jesus would come in John chapter 8, and they would come against him, and they would say, we believe in Abraham. Jesus would say, well, then do the deeds of Abraham. Abraham wouldn't want to kill me like you guys want to kill me. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And then they really wanted to kill him, because not only is he saying he's big, bigger and and, and stronger and greater than Abraham, but he's claiming to be God when he says, I, before Abraham was, I am. But when you go over into the New Testament, uh, farther into the New Testament, the writings of Paul, he says that those who are of faith are the ones who are the children of Abraham. See, this woman, she just wasn't a daughter of Abraham according to the flesh, like from lineage. But she was a daughter of Abraham in the sense that she had faith in the true and living God. And no doubt now her faith in this Messiah of which she's heard, this Messiah is standing before her and has touched her in her body as well. Ought not this daughter of Abraham be healed? He honored her by healing her. He honored her by saying she's a daughter of Abraham. Oh, isn't it good to be called a son and a daughter? And then he honored her as well. You know how else he honored her? And it might, it's not recorded necessarily in this passage, but Scripture will tell it this way. When it is that someone has repented of sin and put trust in Christ, there's celebration in heaven. There's a party, so to speak, in honor. Now, mostly, of course, in honor of the God who saves. But when it is that one repents and puts trust in, in Christ, how many are thankful? There's a celebration that, that breaks out in heaven. And if they can celebrate in heaven, we ought to be able to celebrate here on earth too. Amen. Uh, I tell you, I think it was Brother Kevin, maybe Brother Todd, that I was talking to the other day about Luke chapter 15. The way that that product, the way that older brother knew that something was going on, he heard the celebration. How many know there's, we, we of all people have reason to celebrate if we're in Christ? So this woman was honored. And how many are thankful if you know Christ? then it has been, there has been a celebration in heaven when one lost sinner turns toward home. How many know, if you know Christ, you have been honored by having your sins forgiven and your name and the Lamb's book of life. You'll be honored with a new name. Now, any honor that the child of God receives, our heart is to give that honor and glory back unto Christ. 
but how many are thankful for the honor it is to be a child of God. Yes. We sing the old song, oh yes, oh yes, I'm a child of the king. His royal blood now flows through my veins. And I who was wretched and poor now can sing, praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the king. How many are thankful for that? And so here it is. And one day, if indeed you are in Christ, oh, to hear those words that he records in Matthew, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy, joy, joy of thy master. How many are thankful for that? So an honor unto the woman, an honor unto the child of God. But even more of this, look here. It says, the last verse again, as Jesus said this, this is verse 17, as Jesus said this, how many of his opponents were being humiliated? All of them. And the entire crowd was doing what? Rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. Not only honor to the woman, but even more importantly, honor unto Jesus. Honor. Let there be glory and honor and praises. Glory and honor unto Jesus. For he has created all things and for his pleasure they were created says in the book of Revelation to him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Honor to Jesus. You know, we were watching. They had one of these last night and I've seen them on the news before. I don't know how many of you ever heard of the honor flights. You heard of those? Honor flights is where what they do, they take uh, the organizations, raise money, and they'll get like World War II veterans and Vietnam veterans and uh, even veterans of more recent conflicts. And they'll get these veterans that live in various areas. Our Southwest Florida has one of these organizations too. And they will get these men that have never been to Washington, D.C. to see the monuments that have been erected in their honor. Now all of them are something, but the Vietnam veterans and the World War II veterans especially kind of get to my heart. I've been there to D.C. many years ago, and I saw that world, the World War II is, is even more recent than the Vietnam one as far as the monument being built. And it's a beautiful, beautiful monument there, and of course the Vietnam Veterans Wall, many could be familiar with that, and the, the World War II Memorial, if you've ever been to D.C., it's a, it's a beautiful thing to behold. And what these honor flights want to do is they want to get these men, especially those who are way up in years, I know there's not very many World War II ones left, and they get them, and they'll have, they pay for them to fly there. They have somebody that goes with them to make sure that, you know, many of them need some assistance at this stage in their life. And they take them there to see these monuments that have been built in their honor so that they see those monuments. And they'll show pictures, and there'll be tears in their eyes. And they see them. And then, to top it all off, when they come back home, they got a big crowd of people there at the airport. And when these men, they've only been gone a day. They do it all in one day. They go, they fly them up there, they show them some things, and then they fly them back. And when they get back home, and they come to that airport, there's people standing to their left, and there's people standing to their right. They don't know them, but they know that they have been involved in sacrificing potentially even their lives for the country in which we live. And when they come, and some of them are on wheelchairs, and some of them are on canes, and some of them, of course, are, are fine physically but, uh, as far as being able to walk and what have you. But they come back and they are surrounded by a sea of people. And they're all chanting there and clapping and they're all giving them honor, giving honor to whom honor is due. It's just such a heartwarming thing. And how many know a very good thing? I, I, I get that. It just it touches my heart every time when they come and they do such a thing for those who have given such toward the country in which we live. But can I tell you, as much honor as it is that they would deserve, and rightly so, there is no honor like that that's due unto the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who not only who, who died so that we could be spiritually set free, and not just in a temporary setting, but in an eternal setting, who died to bring us from death to life, from sin to righteousness, from darkness unto light, how, from bondage unto liberty. How many know he deserves the honor? Amen. And what happens is, I, I just kind of in my mind's eye, and you know, you read in the book of Revelation especially, those who had were proud and rejected Christ, one day they'll have the humiliation, so to speak, 
Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They'll give him honor too. And then those who are his children with wonderful hands outstretched and voices to the sky, we will give him praise and we will give him glory and we will give him honor forever and ever into the ages of the ages, a day of honor for our Lord. And how many know we don't have to wait until then to give him honor. We can give him honor right now today. We can give him honor with our words, with our deeds, with our lives, because we want for God to be glorified. Here it is, Jesus, he got honor that day. Honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. A day of healing. A day indeed of hubris or pride. A day of humiliation. Being put in his place, this synagogue official. But then also a day of honor. Can I tell you, for the child of God, I, I hope that when we hear God's word, it is like, healing, not even, not, not physical healing, certainly. Uh, God still touches in bodies. Amen. But healing and strength to our spirit. Daily bread to nourish and strengthen our souls. How many are thankful for God's touch and for God's hand and for God's Amen. healing and his strength in spirit and in body? Amen. Day of hubris, I would tell you, if there be any here this morning that hasn't repented and put trust in Christ, you may not think of it this way. But basically, if you've not repented of sin and put trust in Christ, you're basically like this synagogue official saying, I'm going to do it my way and be okay. No, it never works out well for the proud. A day of humiliation, can I tell you? Humiliation we think of as a bad thing, but can I tell you? When our heart, as the song that we're going to sing here, maybe even Wednesday, when our heart's broken by the love and the power of a holy God, it's a wonderful thing. Amen. We put no confidence in ourselves, but put confidence in Him. And a day of honor, don't you want to honor Christ each and every day? Indeed, when we gather together, it's a time when we get in God's Word and sing His praises. It's a time for an old, happy day. Amen. Let's stand our feet this morning. Father, we come before you today. Lord, I thank you for your Word. If there be any here today that know not Christ, they haven't repented of sin and put trust in Him, in his sacrifice alone upon the cross where he bled and died, not for sins he had committed, but for sins that we had committed, to pay the price that we might be forgiven and free. If there's any here that, and maybe they've never even thought of it this way, but in the hubris and the pride of their heart and their mind have rejected that offer of salvation, I pray your spirit will convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and that they will be humbled and repent of sin, and put your trust in Christ this day in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. And Lord, for those who are your children, I pray that my brothers and sisters be encouraged and strengthened in their, in their spirit today on the Word of God and from the Word of God. Strengthened and encouraged in you. Strong in you and in the power of your might, dear God, would be my prayer for my brothers and sisters this morning. And I pray that we indeed, Lord, would know, like this woman waited 18 years, and some waited 38 years, and some waited 40 and more years. Lord, that we would know, indeed, you do touch in all kind of ways in this life for which we pray and often do. But every child of God will know that final and full day of healing, not only with their glorified body as far as physically, but where they will no longer be uh, uh, tempted by sin or with any weight that would so easily beset us, but will finally fully forever praise the King of kings and the Lord of lords and give you the honor and glory that's due unto your name and unto your name alone. And we pray that we would indeed honor you, Lord Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. For you and you alone are worthy of it all, both now and evermore. And it's in that mighty, matchless name of Jesus that we pray and in the power of the Spirit that we come. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May He lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is a hope you're calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
and the surpassing greatness of his power extended to all who believe. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you today in Jesus' name.